Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Timothy Node, whose lecture is entitled On the Money, Symbolising National Identity in the Design of UK Coins. Timothy Node has worked as a heraldic artist for the College of Arms for over 30 years, uh, where his title is Herald Painter. He's also a scribe and illuminator to Her Majesty's Crown Office and is responsible for many royal charters and other letters patent. Since 1997, he's been commissioned to design coins and medals by the Royal Mint, including five one-pound coins, two gold sovereigns, and several official medals, including both the Gold and, and, Di and Diamond Jubilee medals. He also has a master's degree in the history of art from the Courtauld Institute. So please let's welcome Timothy Node. Thank you very much and good afternoon. I hope everyone can hear me sufficiently. I'm beginning not with a coin, but with a painting, one which actually deserves to be called iconic. I consider the monarch of the Glen relevant to my subject as a seemingly innocuous image which has acquired a host of associations, both positive and negative, many pertaining to aspects of Scottish national identity. As I hope to show, coins may bear similar images, heraldic or otherwise, which, intentionally or unintentionally, acquire layers of meaning that often provoke strong reactions and opposing views. The Monarch of the Glen was originally intended for the peers' dining room at the House of Lords, a reminder for the aristocracy of their estates in the north, country pursuits, and perhaps even the origins of the venison on their plates. The painting and its title are redolent of Queen Victoria and her love of the Highlands. Lancia is often ac accused of anthropomorphism, and the title he gave to the painting hints that a dumb animal might be endowed with noble and royal qualities. On the other hand, it is an image of an untamed, vulnerable, wild creature. For some, this painting is emblematic of the Highland clearances and the appropriation of Scotland by outsiders as a playground for cruel and elite sports. It is often regarded as anachronistic, a kitsch totem for the tartan and shortbread image of Scotland that has no place in the modern world. And for others still, the painting is forever associated with advertising. Dewar's and Glenfiddich whiskey, Baxter's soup, and once again, Walker's shortbread. For better or for worse, the monarch of the Glen has become so identified with the nation of Scotland that its recent acquisition by the National Gallery of Scotland became a national campaign. And yet, the Scottish perception of English superiority refuses to go away. The recent suggestion that the deer was painted in the home counties of England provoked righteous indignation, <laughs> such, as the, <laughs> such as the enduring power of this image. Coins also convey complex messages about national identity and are the most ubiquitous symbols of nation, nationhood. The red deer stag and white heart shown here are both symbolic not of the Scottish Highlands, but of different parts of Ireland. One is naturalistic, the other heraldic. Yet they have both been chosen to appear on coins, not only because they are identifiable images of their country, but also because they are acknowledged to be free from controversial associations, unlike the monarch. Many people claim to, notice, to hardly notice what appears on the money, but when changes are made, they are the subject of passionate debate. The images on coins make visible the abstract concept of a nation state, a collection of individuals who may be citizens by birth or adoption, united under their sovereign and government. Coins are particularly important and sensitive in representing the four nations of the United Kingdom, both individually and as a collective union. They also carry messages about tradition and continuity, most neatly expressed through heraldic and other national emblems. I'm going on to consider some of these matters through my experiences as a coin designer, principally heraldic. The time of change from pre-decimal to decimal currency is one of my earliest memories, and I will be concentrating on the reverses of United Kingdom coins which have appeared during the last 100 years. It is perhaps not the best day to be talking about the connection between royalty and money, 
<laughs> but let's start with depictions of the royal arms. The most familiar and widely used image on coins, as it has been for more than six centuries. While the obverse of a coin shows the head of a monarch, the portrait of an individual, the reverse traditionally features the whole or some part of their arms, the hereditary insignia of the crown, and by extension, government authority. The quartered shield, the garter, the lion and unicorn supporters, the crown and the lion crest have been used together and in isolation on designs for coins. There are, of course, variations on the royal arms for use in Scotland. George Kruger Gray set the standard for 20th century coin design and was responsible for this magnificent version of the royal arms, abbreviated to give greater emphasis to the shield and crown. George Kruger was British born but of German descent, adding his wife's name, surname Gray to his own in 1918. He was highly skilled as a heraldic artist and a prolific coin designer. Kruger Gray was chosen by the newly formed Royal Mint Advisory Committee on the design of coins, medals, seals and decorations in 1922 as one of a school of artists who will find it worth their while to specialise in the production of coins and medals and thereby return to the good old times. In the words of the Deputy Master of the Mint, Colonel Robert Johnson. Kruger Grey was clearly influenced by medieval and Tudor coins, a far cry from the fussy and overblown 18th and 19th century examples. His work combines the decorative patterns of the arts and crafts, as seen in the crown and the shield, with the stylization and modernity of Art Deco, exemplified by the streamlined supporters. He had a great instinct for handling image and images and spaces within the circular field of a coin, in combination with strong lettering. In the early 1960s, plans were made for the proposed decimal coinage, and a limited competition was held for invited artists. The winning designs were drawn by the artist and medalist Christopher Ironside. Among his original designs was the 20 pence piece on the left, in which the full royal arms was given a rather elaborate, almost regency treatment. Ironside's elegant designs are very different from the muscularity of Kruger Grey, as for example in the plump supporters, a naturalistic lion and a dainty unicorn. Ironside's designs were approved, but in 1966, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, James Callaghan, as Master of the Royal Mint, announced a new competition open to the general public. Fortunately, Ironside once again beat off the competition with a new set of designs, including the simplified and improved royal arms on the 50 pence piece on the right. In the event, this image was replaced by the figure of Britannia, but was finally issued in 2013 to commemorate the centenary of Ironside's birth. He summed up his approach in the statement, I wanted, to be as, I wanted to be traditional as far as possible. I was not designing for myself, but for everyone else. When the first one pound coins were issued in 1983, the full royal arms featured on the coins after many years and the crown shield came along five years later. The subject of the royal arms was chosen to represent the whole of the United Kingdom and to punctuate the varying sets of regional one-pound coins. These designs were very conventional, deriving from official versions and with very little style or individuality. In 2014, I took part in a royal mint competition to create a new one-pound coin bearing the royal arms, and I'm, I'm going to tell you about the processes involved. I have been designing coins and medals for about 20 years. I had previously gained some experience of designing a medal, plaster modelling and bronze casting at Rygate School of Art in the 1980s, little imagining that I would one, ba one day be designing official coins and medals. The Royal Mint first invited me to submit designs through my work as a heraldic artist at the College of Arms. The secretary, of the, to, the secretary to the Advisory Committee of the Royal Mint usually commissions competition designs two years ahead of production. A confidential creative brief is sent to five or so selected artists whose design or sculptural skills are thought to be appropriate to the particular project in question. In this case, the subject was specified as the Royal Arms, with the observation that 
The nature of how the arms is depicted is left to the discretion of the artist. Suggestions were made that it could be the full achievement, the shield, or the individual quarters. I began by drawing these thumbnail sketches. I draw and paint the royal arms frequently, but was aware that a conventional rendering of the royal arms, however good, was unlikely to be chosen. I came up with the idea of showing the lion and the unicorn crouching behind the shield, emerging to either side. This allowed for the shield, crown and supporters to be relatively larger, regarding the small scale of these coins. This format was often used in the Hanoverian and Victorian periods. While I was researching my designs, I happened to visit the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich and was inspired by this version of the Royal Arms on a drum from Nelson's Navy. A similar image is shown more clearly in the painting of the arms of George III from a church, although the mantling is coloured incorrectly. The Times masthead is another well-known example of this layout. I developed my ideas in larger sketches, aiming to position the circular garter in the centre of the coin and to balance the other elements around it. Selected artists are usually asked to prepare three or more alternatives as finished pencil drawings, around 150 millimetres in diameter. It requires an understanding of what is feasible to be made as a sculptural relief for striking or casting onto a coin or medal. I'm showing one of my alternative designs here, using the lion and unicorn fighting for possession of the royal banner. This was not shortlisted, perhaps because it did not send out a positive message. <laughs> <laughs> The drawings are photographed and presented to the committee anonymously in the format shown on the right from an earlier competition. The Royal Mint Advisory Committee on the Design of Coins, Medals, Seals and Decorations is a body of highly respected artists and sculptors, academics, numismatists, historians, entrepreneurs and courtiers, which meets four times a year. Garter King of Arms provides the heraldic expertise. For many years it was chaired by the Duke of Edinburgh, followed by Sir Christopher Frayling and currently Lord Waldgrave. The committee shortlists two or three designs and these are carried forward to be made into plaster models around 200 millimetres in diameter. This is a specialised process usually carried out by a sculptor or engraver from the Royal Mint. It can also be done by a digital process directly from the drawing. Once the designers have approved the models made from their designs, they are presented to the committee for the final selection. The coin is then submitted for ministerial and royal assent that is, from the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Queen. The plaster model is digitally reduced and a die is created from which the, coi the coins are struck at the Royal Mint in South Wales. The finished £1 coin was issued in 2015. You might have noticed that I included the Welsh leek among floral emblems. Something else that only occurred to me recently is that the presentation pack produced by the Royal Mint shows a banner of the Royal Arms as used in Scotland, although the arms on the coin represent the whole of the United Kingdom. And I don't know whether this was an aesthetic choice or a political decision. I will go on to show how the individual nations of the Union have been represented on coins by using their arms on separate shields. The cruciform arrangement of shields has occurred many times since the reign of Charles II, with floral and other emblems in the intervening spaces. Although there is usually a small element in the centre to indicate their correct orientation, these coins may be turned around to give precedence to any one of the shields. <coughs> a very beautiful coin in the centre, known as the Gothic crown, was produced in 1847 by the chief engraver to the Royal Mint, William Wyon. He made a feature of the positive and negative shapes formed by the shields and placed floral badges in the intervening spaces. In his, in his Silver Jubilee Florin design of 1935, bottom left, Kruger Gray re relocated the shields on the diagonal and moved the crowns to the top of scepters, beautifully integrating <coughs> the inscription into the overall design. A crown coin, bottom right, was prepared for the coronation of the present Queen in 1953, following a competition. 
the designers Fuller and Thomas simplified the original floral badges at the request of Her Majesty, who pronounced it too busy. Very much in the style of the late Kruger Grey, the coins of 1953 featured the Welsh leek alongside the other floral badges for the first time. I also attempted a design using the separate shields, this time in a tripartite arrangement with the rose in the centre, allowing more space for the other floral badges. William Gardner was a very fine coin design, designer of the 20th century. Like me, he was also a calligrapher. Unfortunately, I never met him, although we both submitted designs for the first two pound coin competition in 1996 at the opposite ends of our respective careers. William Gardner's heraldic style was similar to Kruger Grey, albeit sparer and less vigorous. In his designs for shillings, he united the shields and crowns into an overall straight-sided oval, relating the circle and the accomplished lettering. The crowns do not have the double curve in the arches adopted by the present queen, derived from St Edward's crown, probably because the design of the crown had not been was not already chosen in advance of the decision. The Scots frequently lobbied for representation on UK coinage, and this was the first modern coin to show the arms of Scotland alone. The crest came earlier, as I will show you presently. However, the crown used at this period was still the English or British design, rather than the heraldic crown of Scotland. Although the order of crosses and fleur-de-lis finials has been reversed, perhaps to suggest the crown of Scotland, Thistles originally occupied the spaces to either side of the arms, but were omitted in the final version. The most dramatic treatment of the Royal Shield came in 2008, when new designs for the definitive coins were issued, following a public competition won by the young Welsh designer Matt Dent. His design is an ingenious solution to the problem of giving an assortment of coins equivalents, as he has written, united in terms of theme, content and style of execution. The design combines tradition in its use of heraldry and modernity in its clean-cut styling and the abstract and asymmetrical nature of each individual coin. It has to be said, however, that these coins are still contentious and that the sum of the whole is greater than its parts. The political messages given out by the broken shield are undoubtedly equivocal, as the design critic Alice Rawsthorn has suggested. The ancient heraldic symbol is a nod to tradition. Fragmenting it is a gracious acknowledgement of national differences with a fashionable whiff of deconstructivism. Aside from the shield, other parts of the royal arms may be found in isolation, most notably the heraldic beasts that act as crests and supporters. Kruger Grey designed two very striking shillings, showing the crests of Great Britain or England and Scotland. The stylization of the alert lion on the left-hand coin strongly recalls the Wembley lion, the Art Deco emblem of the British Empire exhibition shown on the postage stamp of 1924. The almost circular crowns are again Tudor looking, with the fleur-de-lis placed centrally on the Scottish version again. And this was the first modern British coin to represent Scotland. Christopher Ironside's much-loved ten-pence piece depicts the lion from the royal crest bounding freely across the coin. The animal is at the same time heraldic and naturalistic, classic in its understated simplicity. The crowned lion is essentially the English heraldic beast, but lions also occur in the arms of Scotland and Wales, so this is arguably also a British symbol. Ironside is shown here with his other popular definitives, many still in circulation. The Welsh Dragon Badge first appeared on a British coin in the one pound series of 1994-7. The original drawings were made by my colleague at the College of Arms, Henry Gray, who unfortunately has never been fully credited for his contribution to the designs. The Red Dragon of Cadwallader was introduced into the Royal Arms as a supporter by Henry VII. But as we have read, already seen with the League, Wales has more recently struggled for representation on the coinage. Wales is not a kingdom, merely a principality or appendage of England, 
was the rather supercilious observation of William Wood's Garter King of Arms in 1898. The other coins introduced two lively designs derived from the shields of England and Scotland, which happily occupied the circles. The representation of Northern Ireland was rather more problematic for the coin designer, as the harp is identified with and used by the Republic of Ireland on coins. In its place, a Celtic cross and a talk were contrived with a pimpernel flower of no heraldic significance in the centre. For the 2002 one pound competition, I designed a set of coins using royal beasts of the United Kingdom. With the lion, unicorn and dragon, this was not a problem, but what to use for Northern Ireland? A royal beast has never been officially assigned to the province, an omission most surprising when 10 heraldic queen's beasts were devised for the coronation in 1953. I initially decided on an elk, which was the sinister supporter of the former arms of Northern Ireland. However, the White Heart of Richard II is also part of the official royal crest of Ireland, although this is seldom, if ever, used. This was a better choice for the revised design, which we saw earlier, and the series was shortlisted by the advisory committee. At the time, the chairman was Professor Sir Christopher Frayling, who subsequently posed the question, can the iconographic language of heraldry, with its unicorns and dragons, fit today's reality? or do we need some other image door? In the event, a series of bridges designed by Edwina Ellis was chosen. However, the committee liked my designs, so the Royal Mint issued them as pattern sets in gold and silver for sale to collectors. As with several other coins in history, they were christened the coins that never were. <laughs> the Royal Beasts were eventually used together on a coin issued in 2016 as the last round pound although not circulated. This is a striking heraldic design by Gregory Cameron with a great sense of movement and balance, an egalitarian combination of the four beasts and the crown of the United Kingdom. The three kingdoms of England, Scotland and Northern Ireland are represented by floral emblems, which may be combined together or used separately, sometimes crowned. The Welsh leek has also more recently been included among the royal badges and used on coin designs, as shown previously. The earliest coins to include all four badges alone were designed by Fuller and Thomas in 1953. Working in the manner of Kruger Grey, their coins are somewhat elaborate, but the sixpence is particularly successful. The four plants are interlaced to symbolise unity as well as giving a sense of depth and movement. Subtleties are introduced such as the extra rose leaf on the left of the flower to compensate for the awkward shape of the leek and thus giving England its customary prominence. A very beautiful design showing the crown Tudor rose was ex executed by William Gardner for the new 20 pence piece in 1982. The polygonal flower echoes the shape of the coin while leaves curl elegantly across the step between the field and the raised edge. It has a pleasing and timeless quality, still fresh after 35 years in circulation. Among Christopher Ironside's decimal coins is the five pence piece with the Scottish thistle, this time crowned with the Scottish crown, recalling a coin of James I who united the crowns of Great Britain. The two pence coin representing Wales features the Prince of Wales's feathers. In fact, they are the badge of the heir apparent rather than being directly associated with the principality. Nevertheless, they are both very attractive coins. Once again, we encounter the difficult question of which emblems are appropriate to use on coins to represent Northern Ireland. Although the situation is stable at present, strong sectarian divisions remain along political and religious lines, which can easily be inflamed by the inappropriate use of symbols. As these randomly selected images of Belfast murals show, Heraldic and other emblems such as the harp, the shamrock and the red hand of Ulster may be used by either side in what clearly remains a very visual culture. Such emblems are therefore avoided for the coinage or carefully used in contexts where they are not likely to cause offence. Christopher Ironside's designs featuring the, featuring the red hand of Ulster appear rather unsettling today. They were apparently drawn up at the behest of the Duke of Edinburgh who felt that Northern Ireland should be re represented on the new decimal coins. 
However, in 1969, the troubles began and the red hand was no longer considered acceptable. On a positive note, the designs first introduced the flax flower, which has subsequently been adopted as a non-partisan symbol for the province. The first appearance of the flax flower on an actual coin came in 1984 with the floral series of one pound coins by Leslie Durbin. Each plant is shown naturalistically and abundantly, encircled by the diamond diadem of George IV, as worn by the Queen on several coins. By using the diadem instead of the royal coronet, the unofficial status of these designs is neatly resolved. The flax is shown with six flowers representing the six counties of Ulster, and is the design for the official logo of the Northern Ireland Assembly taken directly from this coin. The thistle and leek are conventional enough, but an oak tree replaced the rose on the English coin, perhaps to avoid confusion with the flax flowers. The oak has had semi-official status as England's national tree for many centuries, being associated with strength, the Royal Navy, Charles II and the restoration of the monarchy. It first featured as a wreath on the coin of George III, but it's perhaps worth, it is perhaps less well known that it's also a symbol of Germany and has appeared on German coins for two centuries, as it does to this day. The choice of an oak wreath for the badge of the new Royal House of Windsor confirmed its official status, as shown on a coin I designed for the centenary this year at the top. Two very attractive coins were designed by Kruger Grey in the reign of George V, perhaps in homage to the new Royal House. The denominations are represented by the number of acorns. The leaves and fruit are beautifully composed in patterns reminiscent of the designs of William Morris. For the one pound competition held in 2011, the theme was flora and fauna of the United Kingdom. With acknowledgements to some of the coins previously illustrated, it occurred to me that each nation has an official and an unofficial floral symbol and that a pair of plants could be shown in a yin-yang arrangement. The message can be interpreted as the harmonious relationship between the monarch and the people. For England, there is the rose and the oak. For Northern Ireland, the shamrock and the flax. While for Wales, the daffodil is often, is often preferred to the inelegant leek. In Scotland, the thistle is all-pervading, but the harebell is known as the bluebell of Scotland. It is celebrated in a folk song composed by William IV's mistress, Dora Jordan. Alternatives might have been heather or the Scots pine, but the bluebell reads well at a reduced scale. The coins were issued in pairs in 2013 and 2014. The designs on the packs look like wallpaper in tribute to William Morris, who I have mentioned had influenced my designs. Non-heraldic symbols with no official status or traditional usage may also be used on coins to represent national identity. In 1926, the Irish Free State held a limited competition to design a new set of coins. The committee, under the chairmanship of Senator William Butler Yeats, deliberately avoided partisan Irish and, of course, British devices, saying, we will probably insist on there being very simple emblems or symbols, not pictures. The chosen subjects were Irish agricultural animals, and the competition was won by an Englishman, Percy Metcalfe. Metcalfe endow endowed his subjects with a classical dignity. They are naturalistic, but their profiles are clear and emblematic. They were recognised at the time as the most beautiful coinage in the modern world, and have been influential ever since. Similarly, Australia, when it converted from pounds to dollars in the 1960s, chose to focus on its unique national flora, fauna. Some animals had already appeared on their coinage, but Stuart Devlin's designs are superlative. Unlike Metcalfe, whose animals are classical and hieratic, Devlin twisted their poses, integrating the numerals and playing with the surface of the coin's field. The depiction of water at the same time revealing and concealing the platypus on the 20 cents piece is masterly. An official national symbol was also included by using the coat of arms of Australia, but with a special emphasis on the supporters.
I attempted my own series of domestic animals to represent the nations of the United Kingdom for the one pound competition of 2011 when the suggested themes were flora and fauna. The animals I chose were a shy horse for England, horses having been used on coins since the ancient Britons, a ram for Wales, a Highland bull for Scotland, and an Irish wolfhound for Northern Ireland. The latter is associated with a legendary Irish hero, Cuculain, the Hound of Ulster. Although these designs were shortlisted, they were not felt to be sufficiently identified with the respective countries, and were eventually beaten by my own floral series. <laughs> <laughs> And here is a detail of the shy horse drawing and the model made from it. The Royal Mint has also experimented with the use of architecture to symbolise the four nations. Bridges express engineering and technological achievement as well as being a good metaphor for unity. Pictorial techniques such as linear perspective can be problematic on the flat surface of a coin, as they would also be on a heraldic shield. However, these designs are balanced and show variety unified by the architectural patterns around the edges. For the 2008 one pound competition, the theme was capital cities of the United Kingdom, with the suggestion that parliament buildings might be used. The buildings are all very different, Gothic, classical and contemporary. In these unused designs, I attempted to focus on a detail from each building with the addition of the badge of each parliament or assembly. I understand there was much discussion in the advisory committee as to whether Westminster Parliament was identified with London or the United Kingdom as a whole. There has historically often been a conflation of English and British identity in the, in the design of coins, as well as national symbols in general, for example the Union flag. The coins eventually chosen to represent the capital cities are the work of Stuart Devlin. His repeating design is heraldic but very dynamic and modern, homing in on a disc bearing the arms of a named city from a selection of discs which appear to be constantly revolving, like a jukebox. Each city is thus depicted every time. I will only briefly mention the themes of St George and Britannia, in which divine and allegorical beings have been used to represent the nations. Either subject could comfortably fill a whole lecture. The gold sovereign was first issued by Henry VII and has always been a prestigious gold coin associated directly with the monarch, in name as well as subject. The early sovereigns bore images of the monarch and their arms. In 1817, the sovereign was reissued with the equestrian figure of St George slaying the dragon, in classical style by Benedetto Pristucci. St George, as England's patron saint, has appeared on coins of several denominations before and since 1817. However, the subject has become inextricably connected with the sovereign coin. As well as being the badge of the Order of the Garter, which originally encircled the figure, as in the coin here, St George, George was of course the name of four Hanoverian kings. It was a great honour, therefore, to provide the design for the first St George sovereign in which the traditional figure was replaced in 2005. As you may have noticed, I often focus on the essential details of a given subject in my designs to allow for a closer engagement with the action. My St George, as well as being better covered, stands a far better chance of killing the dragon than Pastrucci's. <laughs> in a reversal of the fortunes of St George, Britannia is a personification of Britain which has often been identified with England. She first appeared on Roman coins in the first century AD and is thus by far the oldest British symbol. From the reign of Charles II until the pre-decimal coins of Elizabeth II, she figured on penny or halfpenny pieces. With decimalisation, her image was chosen to represent the whole of Britain at the behest of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Roy Jenkins, in Christopher Ironside's stately design. When the new definitive coins were issued in 2008, there was outrage in the media at the removal of Britannia from the currency. A campaign to save her was launched, ironically with the backing of the Royal Society of St George, her male counterpart. However, the Ironside 50 pence piece is still in circulation, and Britannia has been brought back for an attractive two pound coin by Anthony Dufour, in addition to an annual collector's coin.
I will finish with the introduction of a new one pound coin this year, designed by a talented 15 year old schoolboy. Unfortunately for me, this has brought about the demise of my own one pound coins, but at least a fresh heraldic design in which the floral emblems of the four nations are united within a single royal coronet now graces our coins. The message of tradition and continuity is clear, as well as the allusions to previous coins. As with the monarch of the Glen, the use of heraldic symbols on coins can arouse strong emotions, both for and against. One of the United Kingdom's most respected designers, whose work has appeared on coins, stamps and elsewhere, has written, heraldic imagery, however time-honoured on the coinage, seems to me to have become archaic and no longer relevant. I hope I have been able to show you an alternative view, that heraldry is capable of constant reinvention in style and design, and that new symbols are still being created. Along with a wide range of other motifs, royal heraldry remains the most effective and appropriate way to represent the United Kingdom and its embodiment in the person of the Queen. Thank you.